Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Justin Bannister. I'm the Associate Vice President for Marketing and Communications at New Mexico State University. With us today, we have NMSU Chancellor Dan Arvizu. We also have Director of Athletics, Mario Mocha. Uh, Chancellor Arvizu will make a few opening remarks. We'll have some time for questions. We won't have a tremendous amount of time for questions today, but we wanna make sure that we're answering questions that you have for us today. So, yep. Chancellor. Thank you, Justin. Well, welcome and uh, thank you all for coming uh, this morning. Uh, give us an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the events uh, that we are occur that are occurring here at NMSU. Uh, let me start with a, a couple of uh, maybe an introductory uh, remark, but but uh, want to start with it with uh, knowing that you got lots of questions. Uh, many of them are very legitimate. Um, I will offer at the beginning of this. We are constrained in some of the answers that we can provide the specificity of them due to ongoing investigations that obviously uh, we cannot talk about yet, as well as FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act requirements that uh, are very rigorous and uh, they are focused on the privacy of our students and we are gonna be rigorous in, in making sure that we, um, that we protect our, our, the privacy of our students uh, in that regard. So let me just start with saying a couple things. Uh, a couple months ago I gave a presentation to our community that the state of the university system is strong and that um, we uh, have uh, made significant improvements in the last uh, several years uh, with our university despite weathering of a pandemic and all of the challenges that go along with that. Um, our enrollment numbers are up uh, for the first time in a decade. Uh, our research expenditure uh, pr uh, progress is made uh, very, very, I think, uh, positive uh, uh, improvements and uh, our outreach efforts, which is part of our mission objectives, have all been very positive. We have 14,000 students on the Las Cruces campus, and um, they are receiving an ex excellent education. They are having a good uh, experience at this institution. We have over 400 athletes, student athletes, that are doing well in their, in their particular disciplines. Uh, they are great ambassadors of our program of their sport, of our institution, of our community. And I don't want there to be um, any un misunderstanding that uh, we fully support and recognize their achievements and all the great work that they are doing despite the challenges that we're having uh, with our basketball program. I wanna make it clear that the safety of our students is our number one priority. Right behind that is the integrity of our institution. And as I have reviewed the results of uh, what has occurred over the past few months, uh, it feels like a gut punch. As a parent, as an administrator, as a member of our community, in my alma mater, um, I'm both disgusted and I'm angry about what has occurred. Um, we, be, we have looked and, and done an expansive review of our programs and uh, everything that I have learned is that our men's basketball program has been infected with bad behavior, a culture of bad behavior. There have been some egregious violations of our student code of conduct, and there have been essentially other despicable acts. Um, our review indicates that this culture of bad behavior is contained in our men's basketball program. That is not elsewhere. And I want that to be clear. Uh, there has been, obviously, actions taken as a consequence of both the external and the internal investigations, uh, which have resulted in uh, really putting a reset on our entire program. Uh, we're still doing the investigations. We are um, almost complete with, with uh, the investigation of the November 16th events. And we have recognized with codes of, uh, we have uh, recognized that the student code of conduct has been violated. Um, student disciplinary hearings are occurring as we speak. Uh, and uh, there will be consequences. I cannot talk about that because it's covered by FERPA and the other uh, constraints that we have regarding student privacy. As a result of those investigations uh, are completed, we will be quick to share those and to let you know what we have learned and to recognize those things that need to be improved. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, uh, then uh, have, along with uh, uh, 
uh, athletic director Mario Mocha uh, answer the questions that you might have in front of us. So, for the questions, if you could please introduce yourself and what media you represent, and then we'll have the appropriate individual answer that question. <coughs> Go ahead, Lee Loba. Uh, hi, I'm Lee Loba Sister with KBIA. Uh, my first question to you, sir, is uh, you announced uh, the, the firing of Coach Hire. May I ask why he wasn't let go after the incident in Albuquerque on the University of UNF? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there have been several investigations. Uh, one investigation regarding that particular event um, is not completed, and part of the reason it hasn't been completed is that uh, the coach has uh, represented counsel, and it's been difficult to interview him. Um, in the context of that, we've looked at all the surrounding uh, uh, evidence to essentially bolster our case for the uh, termination of the coach and in that context um, that decision was made based on um, the information that we have at the current time. Go ahead Ugo. Uh, Ugo Perez, uh, Journalism and Media Studies, NMSU. Um, what is being done to help the victim and their family on behalf of the New Mexico State University Council? Yeah, I think, I think the, the main thing I can say, obviously, can't talk about who they are, but I can talk about the fact that uh, uh, we've provided um, both uh, uh, counseling services. Um, we've been in contact with, this, with, the, uh, with the state government. Uh, they provided uh, mental health uh, counseling as well, and uh, we are taking very, very aggressive steps to make sure that those who are, have been affected are uh, getting the kind of counseling and support that they need. Go ahead, call in, then we'll come over here. Yeah, Colin Heber with KTSM. Uh, you mentioned in your statement yesterday that you're still investigating the other assistant coaches uh, within the program as far as like their current status. Have you investigated enough, one, to have terms to potentially terminate them as well? And then looking at the basketball program as a whole, are you intending to have basically nobody who is involved with this year's program here ever again? Uh, to answer your, your first question, uh, there's still an ongoing investigation for the for the assistant coaches, and uh, I think until we get uh, the information that we need, uh, action uh, will be withheld until we know more about what we need to do. Um, uh, you know, maybe I can ask um, uh, Mario to provide a little bit of, of what our intent are for the balance of the season and, and the things that relate to your second question. So, Mario, you want to just restate that call in your second one? Yeah, more. I mean. I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up to that too. Right? Basically, players, coaches who are involved with this <coughs> program, will any of them ever basically be allowed to be involved with next to State men's basketball as a whole? And I would also follow up with that. At what point, because the program is on an indefinite leave of absence right now, at what point will you feel comfortable bringing the program back at all? Sure. Um, well, as the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Arvizu said, it is an ongoing investigation. When the results of those inv or that investigation is in, that'll determine um, the course of action for uh, the remainder of the student athletes, as well as the remainder of uh, the basketball assistant coaches and the basketball staff. Okay, um, so we're going to wait for that. Um, as far as the continuation of the program, uh, there certainly are games left. Our focus right right now is not to rush out and seek a new coach. We're trying to get a resolution to uh, this. Um, uh, circumstance, but we certainly intend on playing men's basketball next year, uh, you know, for the Aggies. Go ahead, Rachel. Uh, Rachel Phillips, ABC 7 Mar. I just wanted to make sure there's been a lot of criticism about head coach Greg Hire being hired in the first place, considering where he came from and the coaches he coached under. Do you regret hiring him? Yeah. Well, I regret the outcome, but more I regret um, what's happened to the victim. Um, you know, I certainly think hindsight is 2020, and uh, I made a list of every coach that I've hired at my alma mater, where I was also a student athlete at New Mexico State, and you know we've had an excellent batting average. Nobody bats a thousand, uh, but uh, I am certainly tremendously um, disappointed in this outcome, right? Specifically for the victim, but for everybody involved. Um, so we'll go back and look at our processes. However, when I look at all the 12, 14 coaches that uh, I've hired as athletic director, most of them have been outstanding in the community, won championships, NCAA appearances, and a lot of them have left us and gone on for you know greener pastures financially. So I don't think our model is broken at all. However, do I have reservations? Uh, 
uh, we'll take a great look at our processes um, on the next hire. Uh, actually, you first, and then we'll go. Uh, Ryan Botel with the Albuquerque Herald. Can you go over the terms of the separation with Coach Hire in terms of his buyout? Was it with cause, without cause, and, and how much is the you know, how much of his contract is the university going to have to pay? Um, I can't talk about specifics necessarily. Uh, what I can say, uh, he was terminated for cause. There's no settlement. Colby Harvey, he is from New Mario, but um, to go back to the point about hiring Coach Hire in the first place, um, what did the vetting process look like considering there were some concerns about where he had come from? Uh, and, and you mentioned taking a look at it. What does that look like to you? Yeah, the vetting process is the same. You know, you, you utilize the people that you know in the industry. Um, certainly, you know, from my background at University of Missouri and Southern Illinois, I mean, I have a lot of contacts in the Midwest, but I also have a lot of contacts on, you know, uh, the NCA selection committee members, et cetera. So you call the people you know. Um, certainly, um, the tree that um, Coach Hire came from, you know, yielded tremendous coaches and Steve Forbes and Chris Jan. So, uh, at the end of the day, I do not believe that we have a broken um, system of hiring coaches. I could I made a list of all the coaches and all the accolades that they've won. So the same process that we used to hire a Jerry Kill or a Chris Jans was the same process we used with Greg Hire. Uh, as I indicated, you know, uh, outcomes are are never preordained, um, and. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, in this situation, for all involved, this did not work out uh, tremendously. So I have a question for Mr. Mocha. So you also brought down, uh, you know, uh, the head coach over here to NMSU, and you also overlook uh, the sports team here at NMSU. So mm -hmm. how was this able to happen under your watch? Yeah. Well, tell me your name and your affiliation. Keepon Sports Media. Okay. Um, what do I feel about this happening on my watch? Yeah. Well, I mean, you brought uh, coach, <coughs> coach higher here. here to Well, as I just illustrated, you know, coaching hires are not infallible. There is not a crystal ball underneath my desk. You know, we've had a tremendous <clears throat> uh, run on hiring very successful head coaches. Um, however, you know, it obviously did not work out in this um, in this setting, and there is, um, you know, limits to what a head coach can actually do. Look, ultimately, that falls under their purview. Uh, and that ultimately falls under my purview, but um, you know we do extensive training with the student athletes. We'll get into that later, but uh, you know sometimes it just does not work out. Go ahead, here. Um, in the police report, wait a minute, keep on switching into the sport. In the police <coughs> report that was given to the media, it only listed the incident that happened last week. Um, is there any other incidents, and are you guys being transparent with the community on the severity? Uh, so, so let me. I, I can't speak about um, uh, reports that come into our, you know, the, the the function at the university that handles Title IX types of incidences. Those are extremely protected uh, for obvious reasons. I can't talk about that. Um, are we being transparent? We're being as transparent as we know how to be under the constraints that we're operating. And, and then just a follow-up question to that. Normally, when um, there is like a police report or something, and we request um, the report and the statement of facts, the names of the people involved are not redacted. Is there a reason that these names of these basketball players are being protected, and when could we expect for those names to be released to the community? Ms. Selena, I would say that that document, when it was made available to the media, there was a note accompanying that. And the biggest issue there is that there have been no charges filed at this time. Should charges be filed, those redactions would be removed and you would be provided that. And are you expecting for charges to be filed? I mean, where are we at in that process? Uh, it would depend on the outcome of that investigation, which is still underway. Okay, Johnny, and then we gotta come back to the chair. Uh, Johnny Coker, KRWG Public Media. Um, so since these events go, you know, the hazing allegations go as far back as last summer, um, is there a plan for NMSU to hire outside investigators similar to after the events of the uh, yes, the, that is in fact the plan uh, to do this investigation. 
uh, as uh, Director Mocha has said, you know, there's obviously responsibilities that go into the athletic department. There are also responsibilities in other functions of our institution that relate to student uh, safety and privacy. And um, we're examining all of those processes to ensure that even where things might be legally sufficient, maybe they weren't adequate. So we're looking at a variety of ways in which we can improve access to understanding the information so that we can take action when, in fact, there's been deficiencies in that area. Sure. And would it be a separate private law firm that you'd be uh, hiring? Yeah. It would be independent, yes. Okay. And I want to make sure we get to everybody's first thing before we get to second ones. So go ahead, and then we'll come to you, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. One, one more on that. I just want to put an existing point on that, just to, just to um, maybe educate some of you of what currently goes on. Um, you know, at the beginning of each year, there's a full squad meeting with all of our student athletes um, where hazing is discussed as well as clearly in our student athlete handbook. That's to all athletes at the beginning of the year. There's also um, our NCAA annual mandated student athlete meeting on sexual violence prevention, intervention, uh, and response um, to illustrate hazing as well. Each student athlete has to sign that, turn that into the NCA. So um, there are specific uh, things that we do annually on this specific topic. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Go ahead. Um, I'm Stephanie Moniz with uh, COAC in Albuquerque. So before this all came out, the police report was filed. Did any member of administration or the athletic department have any knowledge of hazing allegations? And is there any chance that this Um, so, uh, again, you're getting into a space that's a little bit sensitive here. Um, we are doing the internal reviews. Um, I can assure you that certainly certain members of the administration, myself included, were not aware of any of those um, allegations or even incidents uh, before they were reported. Um, it's that process that I think is giving me pause to say, why not? So uh, we're still looking at that, and I can't give you any more speculation about what might occur, but we are looking at that very carefully. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, Chancellor, I mean, Mario <coughs> spoke about his, you know, his process throughout, you know, his confidence and his leadership. As, as his direct supervisor, how would you kind of characterize your confidence in him moving forward? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, Mario has been, um, uh, extremely transparent with me about all things that he knew when he knew them and we have been in constant contact around all the, the various things that we had uh, both control of and uh, those things that were coming our way. Uh, I have not lost confidence in Mario's ability to essentially be our athletic director. Uh, he still has my uh, complete uh, you know, uh, confidence to, to uh, turn this program around. Clearly there are some issues that we need to see. Why uh, did it take so long to understand that there was an issue. Um, we will get to the bottom of that. Uh, again, uh, partially a coach's responsibility, partially a process responsibility, and we'll look at all of those things simultaneously, but uh, I think uh, there's plenty of evidence to support that this particular incident or, or a set of incidents is, is contained in our men's basketball program, primarily a coach responsibility, but the oversight of that is in question, and we will continue to look at that. Will there forward. be more oversight in the future, like future coaching hires? There will certainly be improvements in our processes and, and the way in which we hold ourselves accountable to ensure that our student safety is the top priority and that the, the integrity of our program is sound. So those will continue to be parts of the uh, investigation and the results will, uh, will, will dictate what we do uh, going forward. Okay. Go ahead, Lee Loba, and then we'll come around again. Um, thank you, Lee Loba. So again, KDIA. Uh, my question to you this time is twofold. The, part, the first part of it is that I spoke with a woman yesterday who's a certificate holder um, who is very saddened by what's happening here. It cuts very deeply, as you know, for the community of Las Cruces sure, and we're all Aggie fans. She's been coming to these games for a long time, bringing her family, bringing her grandchildren, um, and she, she feels like this needs to be rebuilt. The program needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. First of all, I want to know if that's how you feel as well. Um, and then on that note, do you have any plans to refund people who bought season tickets since they didn't get to finish out the season? Um, my second question is that you describe this as a culture, right? A bad culture, a toxic culture. But something to be a culture.
culture means that it must have been going on for a long time. So how did it go on unseen for as long as it did? Essentially, how did the university allow this to happen? Uh, the answer to your first question is I feel like that uh, member of our community spoke. That's exactly how I feel. Uh, let me let uh, Director Marta talk about tickets. Well, tickets and then ultimately yeah. the second question. <clears throat> yeah, as far as the question on refunds, you know, there was three regular season games remaining. Uh, we will be announcing uh, an official uh, statement soon on, uh, you know, what season ticket holders can expect. I would anticipate it would be very similar uh, to when uh, New Mexico State uh, could not compete uh, because of the state regulations. Uh, and we had already sold uh, football season tickets, so I'm, uh, I'm assuming we're going to do one of two things, uh, or both things. We'll either issue a refund to individuals or allow them to bank that money for a future uh, Aggie purchase, whether that's this spring or into football or next uh, year's basketball. And then just the yeah, I think that I, I, I uh, would hesitate to speculate on what the results of the investigation are going to produce. Uh, they may, in fact, produce what you're suggesting. Um, we'll take that under advisement and uh, address it directly. Okay. Rachel, and then we'll come back around. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rachel. Rachel Phillips, 87. Two questions for you. Number one, other than three players who have left the program, are the rest of the players required to still be here in Las Cruces? Um, in so much that um, we won't be competing further this year, um, a lot of our uh, basketball players um, are, in, are uh, enrolled in some online courses. Um, so a lot of times they can do that remotely, you know, if there's no basketball requirement. So uh, we're trying to get our arms around, um, you know, who is, um, who is, has that status. And just a second question. When did you both first hear about this, and how did you hear about this, and what were your thoughts feelings? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I heard about it uh, the, day that it, the day that it was reported, um, and uh, we took immediate action that same day. Um, uh, very disturbing to me that, to not have known beforehand. Right. Uh, Ryan with the girl. Uh, Chancellor, I wanted to just clarify, I think you said that after the November incident, Coach Hire hired an Is that not specifically in his contract that he had to be forthcoming with, with those terms? How was that not caused to fire him right then? They had scheduled a meeting internally, and um, that meeting was to be held uh, earlier this week, and uh, the coach uh, declined to show up. Next question. Okay, go ahead, Cooley, and then we'll come back over here. Uh, Cooley Harvey, ESPN again. Uh, Chancellor, uh, you mentioned in your statement yesterday that you wanted uh, ultimate accountability for whoever's responsible once the investigation is completed. I know the investigation is still going on, but as a parent and an alum here, what does that look like for you? That includes, so, so as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, students going through the um, student disciplinary hearings and uh, the outcomes of those hearings to be announced to, once they are completed. Uh, can essentially uh, run the entire gamut from complete suspension from school entirely to complete suspension of all extracurricular activities and ability to compete in other things um, and um, or, or uh, exoneration depending on the outcome and it could be any one of those and I expect that uh, we'll see uh, the, a, a spectrum of those outcomes after the investigation are done. Mario, can I ask you the same question? Yeah. Can you, uh, essentially, uh, in the statement that the Chancellor provided yesterday, there was uh, the, the hope for, uh, for full accountability for whoever is found responsible for all of this. For you as a parent and alum, what does that look like? What is school responsibility and accountability? Well, look, there's university processes uh, specifically in place to um, ascertain guilt, levels of guilt, et cetera. I mean, as a parent, it makes me sick. Um, However, um, there are processes and um, whatever the outcomes from the university, you know, are, uh, we will abide by them, the student athletes will have to abide by them, coaches, et cetera. So, you know, we're just going to let the, uh, the investigations, um, you know, take place, hopefully finalize soon, so we can have some clarity on each individual's um, specific responsibility. 
Uh, yeah, and, and let me just add, as as a, as a parent, I'm angry, um, and I'm and and I know that um, this is not what anybody anticipated for students coming to our institution. And when we, when that outcome is not what we desire, it uh, it behooves us to take full and strong action to ensure first that we send the right messages, and second of all, that it doesn't happen again. So there will be accountability, perhaps uh, beyond what people might expect uh, would be the case, uh, just because it really is egregious. You haven't had a chance to go yet. Do you think if I force this to be a quick word um, to either of you, with uh, this being the second internal, potentially criminal investigation within the men's basketball program, you say you intend to play next year. What, what is your message to Aggies who have faith and trust to come out and support you guys if you all? Uh, the key message is that um, we've had a, a fairly major stain on our reputation and we are committed to re regain the stature of, of uh, New Mexico State, um, you know, sports in the, in the, at, at the national level in terms of our reputation. Um, it, it, uh, it pains me that we've got this particular thing to, 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 uh, to address. Uh, but we will leave no stone unturned. Again, I don't want there to be an expectation that somehow the entire institution is under duress. It's not. Uh, this is this is very much contained, but it is egregious. And we and, and again, we'll take very very strong steps to make that change. Go ahead, Clark. Yeah, for I'll leave it. This comes from Mario. Uh, right. Take you back to the Zoom press conference you guys did about the shooting back in November, and you said that you didn't think there was anything Coach Hire could have done to prevent what happened that night. I'm curious if you still feel that way about that, given the fact that the culture, as you said, around the program this entire time has clearly not been what you wanted. Well, look, my, my heart tells me that when you're sound asleep in your bed and you're awoken that, you know, a situation has occurred, um, you know, it, what is your direct responsibility to that specific situation? However, setting the culture right matters and for individuals who have the ability to think that a night before a big game to get out of the room etc uh, do some things that we would never condone um, is certainly troubling and um, so I think taking my words um, there are specific things I think that might not be somebody's individual personal responsibility however the culture certainly is and does one thing lead to another? Let, let me just make make a point of emphasis here, uh, Colin. I, I, thanks for the question. Um, violation of our student conduct is unacceptable. Curfew violations are unacceptable. I know it happens elsewhere. You hear it about it all the time. Um, we will redouble our efforts. Not acceptable. Not at this institution ever again. So those kinds of maybe. Uh, I would call them things where coaches are inclined to look the other way, will no longer be tolerated at this institution. Absolutely not. We're only going to take a couple more. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so was there an increase in oversight of the basketball program after the UNM campus shooting? And if there was, where do you feel that, um, where those efforts failed? Uh, as far as an increase of oversight, I can tell you on every uh, single away trip, uh, we sent an upper level administrator um, to that game, whether it was myself, whether it was um, uh, one of our two deputy ADs or one of our two senior associates. So there wasn't a time where there was a, a, you know, an away trip from home that there wasn't a senior level administrator with the, with the, with the men's basketball program. Go ahead, Jason. Um, you, I just want to ask you again if there's anything that you can say about previous previous incidents, previous allegations reported at the university. Um, I think you were asked before, but if you could, if you could answer that again. And also, could you give any uh, any insight into protocols that the university has when, when things are reported to the, the proper channels? Mm -hmm. Um, I still can't answer the first question. I, I, as soon as we are able to release information, we will. Uh, it's covered under our FERPA and internal investigations uh, kinds of kinds of uh, uh, constraints. Um, I'm sorry. The second question again was. I asked about the pro, like the 
protocol. Oh, like, yes. What is the process then? Yes. So um, when, when there is a, a, a code of conduct violation uh, last year, we took the, 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 the uh, fairly strong step that we took the reporting out of, out of the athletics department and put it into the general, uh, uh, the, the dean of students process. Uh, and, and that now, it, it's been done a couple of years now, several years now. Uh, and the reason we did that was to make sure that there is an unbiased review of what's going on. If it's in athletics, that would be done by the dean of students. They get to make the call, not, not athletics. All right. so, so that's the process. Uh, if it becomes a Title IX issue, which obviously has to do with, with uh, some sort of sexual uh, uh, activity, if it becomes that, it goes into our uh, Office of Institutional Equity. And they have a very rigorous, very constrained way in which they both seek out to understand what has happened, uh, protect the individuals, uh, offer any kind of, of, um, of announcement, clearly announcements, they call them timely, clear announcements that says, is there, is there a concern to the rest of the campus by what we just learned? That kind of stuff is all done very rigorously in that process. When they are not able to complete their process by whatever, for, for whatever reason, the uh, students don't respond or whatever, then they don't report. That's a deficiency. They don't, they don't let me know, hey, there's a, there's a concern in some particular aspect of our, of our institution that you, need to, you may want to take a look at. I can't tell you the specifics because I'm protected by federal law that says I cannot disclose. Right? But there are ways in which maybe that the information that is useful for us as administrators to go and take action, to go look deeper, to unveil things, that process still, I think, could be improved. And so we have legal adequacy. We don't have adequacy for what I think we're trying to accomplish is make sure our, our, our athletes are safe. How do I do that? That is what's on my mind, and that's the, the, the rigor that we will look at in the investigative reports. How do we do that better? But there are processes that relate to how we would otherwise understand what's going on. And then and those processes need to be, I think, tightened and reviewed. Okay, we have one more question. Go ahead, Richard. Richard Coltharp, the Las Cruces Bulletin. Uh, for both of you, have either of you been in contact with Conference USA and what questions or concerns have they expressed? I, I have spoke to both uh, commissioners at both conferences, the WAC and also uh, Conference USA. Um, in, in, and um, I think both have uh, acknowledged to me that we are taking the right actions and that they are supportive of what we're doing. So, uh, yes, the answer is yes. I don't know, Mario, you might have talked to him as well. Yeah, I've talked to uh, Brian Thornton, the commissioner of the Western Athletic Conference, uh, several times um, just to keep him abreast of things. I've also talked to Judy McLeod, the conference, uh, or the commissioner of Conference USA, several times as well, just to make sure she was up to speed and aware. And, and we've, we've done that from yeah, an athletic they, standpoint. They, it's a conference here today has not had any, any, I guess, reneging on their offer because of this? No. Okay, thank you, everybody. We appreciate it.